A very good evening to you. Thank you for assembling with us this evening here at the Church Church of Christ. Whether you're in person or whether you're online, we appreciate your attendance. If you're visiting with us in person, there's a guest information card on the back of the seat in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling that out for us, we'd like to send you a, an invitation again to, at your next opportunity. And we'd like to have a record of your attendance. We count you as an honored guest, and we'd like to get to know you a little bit better. If you'd stay behind a little bit in the foyer if you have time this evening, we'd love, love to do that and fellowship with you a little bit. We have some announcements for our congregation here. By the way, just in case you have one of these wonderful electronic noisemakers, if you would make sure that's silenced or off during our worship this evening. And I'm doing the same thing. We do have some short announcements for our congregation here. Sister Bonnie Schraub will have knee replacement surgery on Thursday. Uh, Betty Gaiman will have uh, treatments for her skin cancer. Uh, transportation is needed. There is a sign-up list in the foyer. Um, those radiation treatments start on Thursday, this week, the 25th of March. Please check with Linda Planchard for scheduling. There is a sign-up sheet. The location is in New Braunfels. And please bring your cell phone. By the way, Thursday, that's this Thursday, the 25th, and Monday, the 29th, are already filled. But please get with Linda and uh, be able to help uh, Sister Gaiman with her health in that way. Sister Miranda Morell, uh, her cousin's son has passed away, and a friend of hers, her husband, her friend's husband, has been diagnosed with cancer, so keep them in our prayers. This Saturday, our youth are getting together from 4 to 8 p.m., and dinner will be provided, but bring drinks. If you have any questions or de need details, please get with Scott Springer. And this is Tuesday night. We're not often here. A little bit different. It's a wonderful thing, though, to be able to gather together, especially for our gospel meeting this evening. We are continuing our gospel meeting on the unity that we enjoy. And Brother Glenn Hitchcock and his wife Mercedes are here from the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. We again welcome them and look forward to this evening's, this evening's sermon. If you would please bow with me in prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you that you are God. You are our creator. You are our merciful judge. You are our Father. Thank you for adopting us as your children. Thank you for sending your only Son to die in our stead. Father, we glorify your name now and always. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Please continue to bless this congregation and those who are represented here and those that are not represented. All the congregations of your church all over this globe. May we fellowship with one another. May we be unified. May we work to spread the gospel to those who are lost. Again, Lord, please continue to bless us as you have in the past, and we know that you will in the future. Protect us. Provide for us. Please forgive us when we do things that are wrong. Help us by convicting us to repent of our sins. Again, Lord, we love you. Please accept our worship to you this evening. May it come to your throne and be a sweet savor to you. And not only this evening, but may we glorify you in our lives every day. Work in us and through us. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
Good evening, everyone. Please grab a songbook. For those who might be with us online, we use the songs of the church. The first song this evening will be number 97, Encamped Along the Hills of Light. Number 97, Encamped Along the Hills of Light. Sing the first and third verse of this song. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts a well of flame. We'll vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Number 696, There's a Fountain Free, will be our song of, of encouragement after the lesson. 696, There's a Fountain Free. But before we have our introduction of the speaker and our scripture reading, Let's turn and sing number uh, 693. In this song book, it's uh, titled, There is Much to Do, but some may know the song as Lord Send Me. We'll sing the first and last verse of this song as well. There is much to do, there's work on every hand. Hark the cry comes real, comes Bringing through the land, Jesus calls for reapers. I must act to be. What will thou, O Master? Here am I, send thee. Here am I, Lord, send me.
If you would like to follow along with the scripture reading, it will be from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Again, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is in heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade persuade men. For we are well known to God, and I also trust, are well known in your consciousness. Consciences. Thank you, Matthew. It's always an honor to follow you in the pulpit. This is my first time. I will always remember that. Good evening, everyone. We trust that you had a great day. I know that we did. And certainly, in view of your being here and all, I respect your time and all, we'll get right into the lesson. We want to talk tonight about the force of our cause. This is our unity. And this force of a cause is so important to me. Following last night's lesson, you know, we talked about the function of unity how that the laws of unity uphold peaceful churches of Christ throughout the brotherhood. We talked about the law of placement, which means you belong, you have a place. The law of purpose is the one that says you belong. You're placed there by God, Acts 2 and verse 47. You belong because God placed you there for a purpose. You can't be an elbow if you are an eyebrow. The law of purpose says you have a specific function. Then there's also, we discuss uh, the, the great law of peace. When the law of placement and the law of purpose are being followed, there's going to be peace in the Lord's church. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, that there be no schism in the body. You want to overcome division? Know your place. Know your purpose. And then there was the law of perseverance. That law says that we must grow and be built up in the body of Christ. Everyone has a responsibility to grow. And to grow, God is saying that you are important. And we talked about the five adjectives of importance concerning God's people as outlined I uh, went through 1 Peter 2, verses 5 through 7, I believe it was. How that you're special, you're chosen, you're royal. You're not just any kind of people, but you're God's people. And how important that is, that you're holy. And God is saying to those in the body of Christ, the law of perseverance and the law of purpose, you are so important to me that I want you to know that you are set up for success as pilgrims. And you remember the assignment? Some of y'all I know remember the assignment because you remind me of it. I asked you to go and to look up the characteristics of a pilgrim. 
You remember that? That wasn't last night. I think that was night four last. And some did and say, well, I've been waiting for you to ask. Okay, well, I won't ask, but there are at least 21 outstanding characteristics of pilgrims. I won't go through all of them. I know you don't want to be here for all of that. But if you lay those characteristics across the book of 1 Peter, you will learn why we must be evangelistic and why our cause has to have the force behind it that is so important that it is the highest priority that God placed on any commission that he's ever given to a child of God. To go into all the world and teach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe will be condemned. Why would God give us that commission? Well, because we're pilgrims. Pilgrims, I'll give you ten of these. I'll just mention them. I won't go into detail, I promise. I'll get you out of here on time. I do want to respect your time. Number one, pilgrims are always on the move, and they have no permanent zip code in this world. This world is not my home. I'm camping in Canaan's land, but I'm looking for the promised land. Number two, pilgrims are to never naturalize with the broader population. We're just here for a limited time. We're going to keep on moving. And number three, pilgrims practice mutual sharing. They're unselfish. You know any unselfish pilgrims? I hope you can say, well, that's you. Pilgrims always, wherever they go, bear good news and goodwill. Always. And then pilgrims are dependent. Pilgrims understand that the journey is always ahead of them and not behind. Pilgrims model behavior that is not of this world. Why? Because of transformation. Instead of naturalization to the greater population, it's transformation because of God's call to them to go in all the world. Pilgrims are impartial. Pilgrims always obey the call to separate. And finally, pilgrims are often targets of the enemy. But pilgrims never turn back. They don't compromise. They don't back up. Because the cause of Christ is greater than any cause that they could ever possibly know. And friends, when I tell you that, I mean that tonight. We are pilgrims. And when you open your Bible up to the text that was read in your hearing in 2 Corinthians 5, I call this the Pilgrim's Manifest. Why? Because in verse number 1 of 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible gives pilgrims their destiny. Note what the Bible says. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So when I die, I'm not going to roll up in this old earth and stay here. God has prepared a place for me beyond this earth. It won't be this earth. It won't be a renovated earth. It will be in heaven with God. That is the pilgrim's destiny. And folks, you need to understand why that's important. Because God made us pilgrims. If God made us a pilgrim and he calls us home, why would he return us to the same place we've been roaming all these years trying to seek and save the lost? Well, that's another story. Let me move on. Not only do we see this as our destiny, the pilgrims manifest it, see our destiny, we also have our desire. Look in verses 2 through 4. For in this we groan earnestly, underline that word desiring, desiring to be clothed, with our habitation, which is from heaven, again, not from earth, but from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. We have a desire to go home. But we can't go home until we do the Lord's business here. And we need to get busy. We need to wake up. We need to move out. We need to get right with God and with the world with the bright message that will save the world. There's no impact on this world until the gospel goes forth. You can say what you want. Politics can't save it. Anything, materialism can't save it. And rulers can't save it. Only the gospel can save it, Romans 1 and verse 16. And so this is our desire. I can rest in the fact that God is in control, which means 
I can face things that are out of control and not act like I'm out of control myself. Why? Because I'm a pilgrim. I have the desire. I have a knowledge of my destiny, which is in heaven. But, number three, verses five through eight, because of our drive. Our drive is important. Notice what the book says. Now he who has, <clears throat> now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. We are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleasing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. God has given us the information that we need to be able to walk by faith and not by sight. The Spirit in the first century did it through miraculous manifestations. The Spirit in this century does it through God's revealed Word, which was revealed by the Spirit Himself. When we follow the words of the Spirit, the Spirit teaches us to walk by faith. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God has been transmitted to us by the Spirit. And therefore, we have this drive within us to do God's bidding. And that drive is to walk by faith and not by sight. I see people all the time, I don't see why we got to do it this way. Because you're walking by sight, not by faith. We need to understand we're pilgrims. There are things that we won't be able to see, but by faith we go on that journey because God is going to lead us to where he wants us to be so that souls can be one for Jesus. And so that is our drive. I'm just introducing this. This isn't my main text, by the way. So you just hold on there. Now, when we talk about this, we have this force that is a cause that's greater than ourselves, as outlined in verses 9 and 10. Please note it. Therefore, we make it our aim or our drive, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. You remember the law? A purpose that we said it last night was to glorify God. Well, here it is in action. We are here to be well pleasing to him. That is our duty. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done, whether good or bad. Because I know that there is coming a time when we are going to be judged whether it's my daughter, whether it's my wife, whether it's my best friend, or my enemy, or my outlaw or in-law, I know that God expects me to be the force behind evangelism to this cause so that I can go and talk to somebody about their soul. Not just anybody, but everybody about their soul. And so this is our drive to be able to do that. And our duty is to be well pleasing to him. And in verses 10 through 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's the force of our cause. Because of a day. Verse 10 and 11. Our day. The day when the hearts of men of women all over the world will be judged by the gospel of Christ according to the fixed principle of righteousness. And it is the duty of every pilgrim. I mean, every pilgrim. Now, you may say, well, Brother Hitchcock, you just don't understand. I can't just get out like that. Do you not know? We win people not only by epistle, but also by example. I thank God for my beloved late mother-in-law, Odell Dawson. When I first met Mercedes and I first entered into the threshold of her family's home, her mother was the first one to say anything to me about the gospel of Christ. Mercedes, are you going to try to get him together with Brother Duncan for a Bible study? You know, he looked like he might be a good candidate. Me wanting to impress my future mother-in-law, oh yeah, you know, I love the Bible. I, I studied the Bible. You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying, you know, I was in, 
I was in, I thought I was in love. I was in lust at the time. Eventually, I became in love. But you know, I was trying to impress her with that. I, I, I do that. But her example led me to study God's word. And in studying God's word, it wasn't about Mercedes then. It was much more than Mercedes. It was about my soul. When that brother laid before me the fact that I sinned against God and that my sins grieved God and that the wages of sin is death, oh, I thought real seriously about that thing. I thought, you know, I could die today outside of Christ and go to a devil's hell. I still remember the words of the old preachers. They used to say, repent or perish. You remember that? That's probably all you remember. But you probably didn't remember turn or burn. Or, or what about flip or fry? That's what the old preachers used to say. And you know, it didn't, it didn't have to go to that extent for me. Because I knew that my soul was in jeopardy of being lost. I was religious, but I was religiously wrong. And somebody who was a part of the force of a cause, came to me with God's word and helped me to see how to walk right, how to talk right, how to turn in a new direction and be right and stay right. And as I mentioned the other night, Titus 2 and verse 11, for the grace of God to bring us salvation, have appeared unto all men. But what does the grace of God do? It teaches us that we can deny ungodliness. And worldly lust. There's a teacher named Grace for each and every one of us that tells us you can deny ungodliness. You can live right. You can stay right. And you can die right. And folks, when you understand that, this is the force of our cause this day. So I want to talk about the day there. In verses 10 through 11, let me read it to you again. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to that which he has done, whether it's good or bad, knowing therefore, who? Christians, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Pilgrims, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. The day known as the judgment day. You may not have planned for it. A lot of people don't. But that's why God sent pilgrims. Isn't that right? The force of the cause of Christ is to demonstrate good news wherever we go, regardless of the zip code. And so this is the pilgrim's manifest. When I look at 2 Corinthians 5 and some other passages as well, this is for pilgrims. This is for people who have courage, who have backbone, who have, who are living right, who are practicing New Testament Christianity and taking that to other people. They care enough about folk that they can see them as souls first rather than a body first. And it's, what's so important about this is this day involves five different points. That can be good news for some, bad news for others. Let me go to a similar passage. Uh, Matthew 25. In verse 31, Jesus delineates the day of judgment. The Bible says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he set upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. The sheep will be on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Every pilgrim knows. We go out into the highways and byways. Discussing the matter of individual people's souls in view of the day. 
that is on your calendar. In view of the day that's on my calendar. There are at least four months that starts with a J. Isn't that right? You say, no, Glenn, it's three. There's June. Well, let's start with January, right? January, June, July. Well, what's the fourth one? The judgment. See, it's on my calendar. I know it's on there. And even though it's a day, I mark it with the months. In my prayer, I pray, Lord, come. Come, Jesus, come. Come on, Lord, come. Why? Because I'm a pilgrim. I, I have a desire to go home to be with the Lord. You may say, well, not now. Well, then you must not be a pilgrim. I'm ready to go home. You know. A boy said, uh, you know, they're taking up an offering. They, they get ready to, to, to leave everything and go to heaven. He said, are they, are they taking it up now? Because uh, can I wait a little while? When the Lord comes, it's time to go. All this other stuff going to be left behind. Actually, it won't be left behind. It's going to be burnt up. Second Peter 3, 9 and 10. So there are five characteristics. There is the reality of the judgment day. Friends, may I assure you, as a pilgrim sent from God, that the judgment day is just as real as the pews that you're sitting in. Just as real as the lights above your head. The judgment day, my friends, will come as a thief in the night. And as it comes as a thief in the night, this old world that you love so much is going to be burnt up. So you need to prepare. All of your trust and materialism will be burnt up. It'll be gone. Like I said on Sunday, materialism is like a mousetrap. Got plenty of cheese in there, but there are no happy mice in a mousetrap. None whatsoever. Isn't that right? And so we need to understand that this day is a reality. Jesus said concerning that day and his word as given by the Holy Spirit in John 12 and verse 48, he that rejects me and receives not my words have one that will what? That will judge him. The words that I have spoken shall judge you in the last day. These words that Jesus has spoken are the words that pilgrims are trying to tell you about. Your best friend may have brought you here so that you can hear this message. He or she is trying to tell you that they love you. And sometimes when you won't listen to them, maybe you'll listen to this old crazy short preacher up here. I've got some taller than me, by the way. So, But the message is clear. If we reject Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world, John 129. And we stand before God in the day of judgment. We have no defense. We will be among the goats that will be departed to the left. And as I continue to remind my brethren, you cannot live like a what? Like a goat and die like a sheep. It won't work. James 1 and verse 8 says a double-minded man is unstable. In all his ways. And so we have the reality of the judgment. Then number two, we have the certainty of the judgment day. That day is just as certain as two great events that found in the Bible. Number one, it's just as certain as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, the Bible says, And in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now have commanded all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he have appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. And here's the link right here. Whereof he has given assurance unto all men and that he have raised him from the dead. The judgment day is tied to the resurrection of Christ as a certainty. It is an adverb of time. When the Son of Man shall come. Friends, don't doubt it. It's going to happen. 
I don't know when, but I better be ready. And pilgrims are trying to tell you to get ready also. But also, the second characteristic that ties the judgment, in addition to the resurrection, the judgment day is also tied to death itself. Recall Hebrews 9 and verse 27. There the Bible says, And it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The judgment day is tied to death. You don't believe that? You just ask the rich man and, and Lazarus. In Luke 16, the old rich man, he fared sumptuously. He was doing all right, wasn't he? Robed in purple, just having a great time. But then he had to die. Make no mistake about it, folks. I, it doesn't matter how big your garage is. Doesn't matter how many cars you have. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter how much influence you have. The grave is the same size for each and every one of us. The same size. And God is trying to tell us something. When you die, there won't be any post-mortem sermons. All the sermons you're going to get will be the sermons you get from pilgrims right here, right now. And tomorrow is not even guaranteed. I had a meeting in uh, Bottlesville, Tennessee one time, and uh, I was uh, preaching on the uh, brevity of life. I took a book of matches out that I had to borrow from someone because I don't smoke and I don't carry matches. <laughs> Struck a match and blew it out real quick and said, that's the way your life is. It's just a little puff. Pierce for a little time and it's gone. Friends, one day you just go up and die. And without Christ in your life, it's going to be a miserable existence. And I, and I, and I say this because I don't want to go there, and I don't want you to go there. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. But we have the certainty of the judgment day. But number three, we also have, in addition to the reality of the judgment, in addition to the certainty of the judgment, the judgment will involve separation. And for pilgrims, this really hurts our hearts because we talk to and study and talk to people all the time about the gospel. And when the curtain is rolled up and we're standing before the judgment bar of Christ Jesus to give an account for the things that we've done, whether good or bad, some of us are going to be separated. Some of us will be separated. A grandson from a grandfather. A mother from a daughter. Children from their parents because of things that they ought not have done. Nieces and nephews, aunts and uncles. And in the silent city of the dead, some are land even today. We wish we had another chance to talk to them. But that Opportunity is gone. And yet, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have family members that are still alive today who can say without hesitation, you never mentioned him to me. If that's the case, that is a tragedy. Yeah. Why? Because we're pilgrims. We're pilgrims. One of the reasons, and I'm not patting myself on the back, but one of the reasons why we moved from our retirement home in Georgia back to Virginia because we still have family members that haven't obeyed the gospel. We All the ones in Georgia we kind of got. Now it's time to go back to Virginia. You know? Why? We're pilgrims. We're not naturalized to one place when there are souls to be one for Jesus. You need to remember that. I know that's hard for some folks, but that's just the fact of the matter. That's the pilgrim's manifest, manifesto. That's our destiny. And when we understand this, what separation is going to be like, 
In Luke 16, again, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man's on one side, not because of his riches, but because he didn't do the will of God. You know? There's nothing wrong with riches. But if you don't do the will of God in your riches, if you don't seek the unsearchable riches of Christ, you're lost. You're lost. Remember the boy in Luke 15? Sued his father for his inheritance. Thought he was so big and bad that, you know, swelled his chest up and said, I want what's mine now. And his loving father granted his wish. The boy went out and wasted his life in righteous living. Wound up in the pig pen. Tragedy in a far country. We have so many family members that are suffering a tragedy in a far country. And we won't go to them because we won't be pilgrims. Brother, sister, you need to be a pilgrim. You need to have the desire, the drive, the duty because of that day to back this cause. Because the force behind the cause is the day of judgment is coming. And it's going to involve a separation. And John 15 tells me that if I am not fruitful for the Lord, I could be on the other side in this separation also. And I mean the left side. You know. Now, I say that lovingly because, again, you say, well, Brother Hitchcock, you just don't know what I do. That's right. But God does. That's why I'm not the judge. God knows. And this separation will be done according, again, to the fixed principle of righteousness. Go back there again in Acts 17. God says he will judge them according to righteousness. What does that mean? God won't show partiality. God is impartial, without respect of persons. Paul says in Romans 2, God judges without respect of persons. That means you can't buy your way out of this one. You know. And since death is an officer that no man can bribe, when you die and your body goes back to the dust where it came from and your soul goes before God in the day of judgment and you face separation because of rebellion. Thank God that that young man came to his senses and says, I will arise and go to my father's house. It's never too late to change. Just look at Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but now you're the servants of righteousness. It's never too late to change. You can get out as far as you can think you can be, but it only takes one step to turn around to God. But separation it's going to be between a lot of my family members, a lot of your family members. Now, separation is going to be between a lot of our family members that we know of as mankind. I'm not just talking about your zip code. Now, I'm talking about the world. The importance of sending pilgrims as missionaries to other parts of the world. I understand Brother Stan's going to be one of them here full on, going out somewhere. That's great. But he's just one person. All of us are missionaries. Let me say it again because I know you won't get this. All of us are missionaries. You still didn't get it. All of us are missionaries. Your zip code requires your presence. Your zip code requires your example. Your zip code requires your actively engaging in giving a message of hope to people who are lost. Separation. Number four. Is that number four? I don't know. Verse 33. And the sheep will be on the right hand. The judgment day will involve joy. Oh, how 
happy it will be on that day. To hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful pilgrim. Enter into the jar of my kingdom. Won't that be wonderful? Friends, I want to go to heaven. I want to experience joy to be able to sit around the table and fellowship with Paul. I got a few questions I want to ask him, by the way. You know, you know, uh, what was that thorn in your flesh, boy? But it won't matter so much because I'm going to be with Jesus. I'm going to be with the Lamb. I'm going to be enjoying fellowship. Be praising God where there is no night. There's no tears. There's no pain. And one of the things I really like, there won't be any bills to pay. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Joy. And then I hate to say it, but it's there, friends. Helplessness. The goats are on the left. The guilty are on the left. In Matthew 25, they say, well, when did we do this? Jesus says, you visit the sick, you've done it unto me. You gave him a cup of cold water, you've done it unto me. All these things, you may think light of it, but when you do these, when you show mercy on others with the good news and compassion and care for people, God says, you've done it under me. Helplessness. Isaiah 48 and verse 22, there is no peace for the wicked. Helplessness. Part-time Christianity equals full-time failure. Helplessness. Helplessness. You can't play Burger King and expect to go to heaven. You can't have it your way. You have to be KFC. I'm not talking about chicken. Kingdom first Christian. Colossians 1 and verse 18. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Our unity demands the force of our cause. The force of his cause. Because of the day. The judgment day. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We must persuade. And in persuading that. That means you have to convert everybody. It means you have to teach them. You have to go to them. You have to make it so that they can't say. You never mention him to me. You never mention him to me. And as much as I love my family members, I love the family of man. I try to be approachable. I got it on a, I think I told you, I don't know if I did or didn't, but uh, the first time I came to Texas, did I tell you that one? Came for basic, Lackland Air Force Base. These three women got on the, uh, they were on the plane, and as I was uh, getting off, coming into San Antonio, Texas, these three pristine, sweet little ladies, beautiful gray hair and all, looked at me, my, my, they show growing tall in Texas, don't they? <laughs> and I said, lady, you know, I'm from Virginia, and quite frankly, I ain't seen a tall Texan yet. And they go, whoa, oh, 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 well, well, baby, you will before you leave. You know, trying to be approachable to people, sometimes it's difficult, especially if you're a little guy like me. But what's important is, I have to let Christ radiate from my person. I'm a pilgrim. If I intimidate you because I'm tall, I sit down. If I intimidate you because I'm a certain size, 
or a certain color, I diffuse all of that. You know how I do that? Book, chapter, and verse talk. You know, God loves you. God loves us all. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we can just unite on things religiously without a fuss or a fight or an argument? Don't you love your Bible? I do. Boy, I get a lot of courage and inspiration from my Bible. Would you like to study the Bible sometime with me? And then if I'm by myself, as a female, it's with me and my wife. <laughs> Got to have Mercedes there. I ain't going there by myself. I ain't going to do that more. But conversation, because of the day, it involves a certainty, a reality, a separation, joy, but also helplessness. We who are pilgrims know we have to give our best to pass the test. Help me to walk so close to thee that those who know me best can see. I live as godly as I pray, and Christ is real from day to day. In my home are those who see, too many times the worst in me. My hymns of praise were best unsung, if I do not my tongue control. Make mine, O oh Lord, through calm and strife, a glorious and unselfish life. Help me with those who know me best, for Jesus' sake, to stand the test. This is a force that involves the uniting of Christians in every congregation coming together to impart a message of love. A message that never grows old, that will never die out, and a message of which we ought never to be ashamed of. God wants us to come to the forefront of this world and make a difference. The devil has been busy and doing its due. It's time for us to do our thing. Amen. Sin will take you further than you wanted to go. Sin will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. But because sin will cost you more than you want to pay, God sent pilgrims into the world. That's us. I don't apologize for this lesson because it's about unity, but it's also about a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And I want you to experience joy. And I, as someone said, well, preacher, you, you know, you just stepped on my toes. I'm not stepping on toes. I'm trying to aim at your heart. Amen. And as I close, I close with an elder's plea. I say this to the congregation at home as well. Before you assume, learn the facts. Before you judge, understand the why. Before you hurt someone, you need to feel. And before you speak, taste your words before you spit them out and think. When you do this, you will know why God is so thankful to have Christians who are special, who are holy, who are his people, who are chosen, and who are royal citizens, and above all, who are pilgrims. Tonight, if you're subject to heaven's invitation, repent of your sins, confess in the mighty name of Christ with your mouth before men, be baptized in water to have your sins washed away. If you have any questions about that, we stand ready to study with you, to answer any questions you may have 
Don't leave tonight without knowing where your soul's destination is going to be. You can know whether you're going to heaven or whether you're headed for hell tonight. It's in the book. As I always say, when in doubt, to identify the crook, look in the book. John 10 and verse 10. If you're subject in any way to heaven's invitation, come now. While together we stand and sing. closing song will be number 167, He Loves Me, and then we'll be led in our, our closing prayer. We do want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. Uh, we've only got one more lesson. Uh, it's going by very fast. Uh, you know, it's times like these when it goes by too fast. Um, we have wonderful preachers here. They give wonderful messages all the time. It, it's always good occasionally, though, to get that uh, in, uh, infusion of, of talent and, and gospel preaching. From, from other sources. So hopefully we've all uh, been uplifted by the messages so far, and we will uh, get one more great lesson tomorrow night. 167, He Loves Me. We'll sing the first verse and then be led in our closing prayer. Why did the Savior heaven leap and come to earth below where men Receive because he loves me.
Hey, Father, we're so thankful that uh, you allowed us to be together this evening, that we can sing praises to you, hear your word. We're so thankful for bringing uh, Glenn to us. We're thankful for his abilities, for his ability to preach your word and its truth. And we're thankful for him. And as we bless us as we uh, go from here, that we'll uh, take your word with us. And we'll strive to bring uh, glory to you and be servants in, in our life and service to you. That's us all in Jesus' name. Amen.